Holy moly, it's mid-March and it's time to get shredded for your next summer holiday. But you have a fat face and a fat lower back to match, which isn't very beach-worthy, buddy. Keep watching, I'll teach you exactly how to use pharmacological aids alongside best practices so you can spot reduce stubborn body fat areas, you lazy dad bot chunky fat piece of sh**. Vigorous Steve here, just keep in mind, I can't emphasize this enough, you can't outdrug a bad diet or inactivity. You're still going to have to put in the work. And just to be perfectly clear, you don't have to incorporate the pharmacological aids right from the start of your cutting phase. You haven't even identified the stubborn body fat areas yet because you're still fat everywhere. At the start of your diet, you'll get fat loss regardless. All you need to do is simple caloric adjustments bring your calories down slightly by restricting your carbohydrate intake and increasing your energy expenditure with daily fasted cardio, or post-workout cardio, or walking in between sets, or 10-minute walks, or doing the standing desk, right? whatever you need to do to keep your energy levels up and sustained beyond what you were doing during your off-season bulking phase. That's how you get lean. And then when you reach 8% body fat or 10% body fat, you're uniformly lean, but you still have some body fat areas, stubborn body fat areas, which are a little bit more chunky than other places. That's when you deploy some fat loss enhancing drugs, not before, don't be an idiot. So let's get started with removing stubborn body fat from the face and then work our way down as we discuss fat loss pharmacology and methods to get diced to the socks. Losing fat in the face is reasonably straightforward. Just go hungry and stay hungry for weeks on end. And you'll see that with most fat loss journeys, generally speaking, the face is the last place to get lean and in shape. Because if you're uniformly lean after a couple of weeks of dieting and you're, you removed the chunk and now you're, let's say, 10% body fat, then your face is suddenly streamlined as well. Personally, I'm 10% body fat right now and look at my face, pretty chiseled. If you want to become more attractive to the opposite sex or the same sex or unisex or polysex or intersex, man, I can't even keep up anymore. Basically, if you want to become more attractive, period, lose fat. Get a chiseled jawline and usually things will work themselves out for the best. And for those of you out there that follow intermittent fasting with an eating window of let's say six to eight hours, I'm sure we can all agree that your face is the leanest right before you break fast and you have your first meal. And for all of the guys out there that have giant watermelons in between their legs and they're not afraid of fasting, losing a little bit of body weight, not going catabolic in the slightest, for the guys that fast for multiple days in succession, you guys know that your face is the most chiseled after three days, four days, or five and a half days of fasting. And I'm not entirely sure which hormonal pathway causes this effect, but it appears that going hungry for a while and keeping your stomach empty streamlines the face the most. Is that from low somatostatin levels and elevated ghrelin levels, which increases growth hormone secretion downstream? Is it from low insulin levels and elevated glucagon levels, which has a favorable effect on fat loss? more on this later, it could all be entirely true. But if you can't deal with the hunger for weeks to months on end, then look into glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists. There are many on the market and are on the screen right now. That being said, if you're blunting your appetite with these kinds of medications, you're also preventing hunger signaling and the hormonal response which follows that. So you might not get um, a substantial amount of fat loss from your face. Your mileage might vary. There's liraglutide, dulaglutide, exenatide, semaglutide, terzepidide, and retrotrutide. I would say that the most effective of these medications are either terzepidide or retrotrutide because they're combination medications containing glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists plus a gastric inhibitory polypeptide receptor agonist. And in the case of retrotrutide, also glucagon. Again, more on this later. I would say that the only pharmacological interventions that are known to help with fat loss from the face assuming you're in a caloric deficit and you perform vigorous exercise and cardio here and there throughout the day, and you also go to bed hungry, but not so hungry to the point you can't sleep anymore, is either exogenous growth hormone or a growth hormone secreted gog combination. These are probably your best bet, perhaps alongside GLP-1 plus GIP and a glucagon combination medications. It appears that the ideal dose of growth hormone for fat loss is anywhere between 1.2 IUs up to 1.5 IUs, depending on body weight, but most people would prefer to run two IUs of growth hormone because that appears to help with sleep quality as well. And if you go with a dose anywhere between 1.2 up to 2 IUs growth hormone before bed, and you go to bed somewhat hungry, meaning that your insulin levels are nice and low, which is also favorable for fat loss, 
then I would say with prolonged use over weeks to months, that the face slowly but surely gets leaner and leaner and leaner to the point it might be a little bit too much, but it's highly dependent on you and what you consider to be attractive and favorable regarding your facial aesthetics. And if you decide to go with growth hormone secretagogues, make sure you watch the best practices and optimization video, which I dropped a couple of weeks ago. I'll link it at the end of this one where I teach you exactly how to get maximum growth hormone secretion by stacking growth hormone secretagogues and perhaps a couple over the counter supplements. If you decide to go with MK677 or GHRP6, which are known to make you hungry, keep in mind this is not the exact same hormonal response as having an empty stomach because those are merely agonizing the ghrelin receptors. So you feel hungry, but it doesn't mean that your stomach is empty, that your insulin levels are low, and that your glucagon levels are potentially high, favoring fat loss. And again, both growth hormone and growth hormone secretagogues will greatly improve sleep quality and perhaps sleep duration, which is also good for overall fat loss. Moving down to the chest, you had a great off season. You're now 20% body fat to make those sweet, sweet gains, but you also have man boobs. This is problematic. This is not very aesthetic unless you're into that kind of stuff, but I highly doubt it. So let's address that. Chest fat is mostly related to estrogen. Now, your estrogen could have been arranged throughout the entire off-season where you're accumulating body fat on your chest and perhaps other parts of the body. But if you want to get that chest fat under control, it's probably best to manage and control your serum estradiol levels. And if your estradiol levels were chronically elevated to the point you have gynecomastia, keep in mind that you can't diet gynecomastia away and you can't get rid of gynecomastia by megadosing raloxifene you'll need surgery. So if your man boobs actually contain some real tissue, you need surgery to get that tissue removed. Maybe do a little bit of liposuction around the area so your nipple doesn't show an indentation, All right? The excessive adipose tissue that's giving you man boobs and perhaps surrounds your gynecomastia, whether there's gynecomastia or not, it can simply be dieted away with prolonged caloric restriction and perhaps if needed, intelligent use of a selective estrogen receptor modulator to block the estrogen receptors and have favorable fat loss in this stubborn body fat area. Unfortunately, selective estrogen receptor modulators are also linked to blood clots, giving you deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolisms or stroke, which can be quite deadly. So that makes selective estrogen receptor modulators not very sustainable. And they also lower IGF-1 levels cause blurred vision or double visions or floaters or eye sensitivity to light, right? There's a boatload of side effects which are on the screen associated with selective estrogen receptor modulators. So please, if you were to go this route, do additional research. No matter how you put it, using serms long-term is risky, especially nowadays where blood clots are almost given away freely, right? So you can't be too careful. Please do additional research. And there are a few prerequisites in case you want to use tamoxifen long-term to block the estrogen receptors just to be safe, right? We have uh, clotting factors that we can analyze through blood work. And while you're at it, do a CT angiogram and see if you have a CAC score greater than zero. If it's over zero, you have some plaque buildup in the coronary arteries or other arteries of your heart. Don't risk it. Don't take it. Don't be stupid. Now that you know the risks, you can decide if it's worth it or not. Don't say I didn't warn you. Ultimately, it's your decision. It's your body and your responsibility to do additional research and decide this on your own. While estradiol has a ton of benefits and contributes to fat loss to a certain extent by regulating glucose homeostasis in the bloodstream, elevated levels can actually hinder fat loss from the chest and the lower body for that matter. And thus it's best to keep serum estradiol levels favorable. And while 60 to 120 milligrams raloxifene daily over two divided dosages are known to shrink gynecomastia by about 50%, again, it doesn't remove it completely. If you want actual fat loss in a caloric restrictive state, right, you still need to do everything right, then look into 10 to 20 milligrams tamoxifen, Nolvidex, over two divided dosages, which also has a hidden benefit to shrink gynecomastia, albeit not as potently as raloxifene does. So you might hit it from two different angles, 
get your chest fat down and shrink your gynecomastia to the point it's barely noticeable. Tamoxifen is actually a prodrug for three different metabolites, one of which being norendoxifen, which is a potent aromatized inhibitor. And then there's amimoxifen and endoxifen, which are the actual selective estrogen receptor modulators. They have a 178 affinity for the estrogen alpha receptors and 338% for the estrogen beta receptors compared to estradiol. So the blocking potential of the estrogen alpha and beta receptors very, very high. And this drug lowers serum estradiol concentrations, which would otherwise have a negative effect on further fat loss from these stubborn body fat areas. Oh, and before you ask, please don't run raloxifene and tamoxifen together, especially at higher dosages. I mean, if you're after blood clots, that's exactly what you're going to get. And again, guys, I would only consider tamoxifen after and only after you've already reached 8% body fat, but preferably even lower. If you notice that you uniformly lean, but you still have stubborn body fat on the chest, right? Your glutes are shredded, your lower back is gone, your lower abs is detailed, but you still have some stubborn fat on the lower chest. All right, go right ahead, continue with your diet, 10 to 20 milligrams tamoxifen on top. And then within four to six weeks, this stubborn body fat area should be significantly lean and the gynecomastia should have shrunk to the point you barely notice it, but you might still need surgery right keep this in mind and otherwise what i would honestly prefer you to do is look into dhc derivatives like masterone or primabolin the active compound or some of their metabolites are known to act as aromatized inhibitors and thus lower serum estradiol levels some of the metabolites might actually block the estrogen receptors or inhibit estrogen mediated gene transcription and since both masterone and primabolin have been extensively studied in the context of breast cancer where they have anti-estrogenic effects they might have additional beneficial overlap into adipose tissue of the lower chest as well, even though that hasn't really been di directly investigated. So the sustainable route would be to use either Mastron, Primbolin, or perhaps Boldenone, which all have a suppressive effect on serum estradiol levels for the duration of your cutting phase or contest prep. And then if needed, and only if needed at the end, when you still have stubborn body fat, then and only then is where you deploy the tamoxifen. And if it's really stubborn, you might even need an aromatized inhibitor to really crush your serum estradiol levels to, um, well, very libido unfavorable ranges. But if you want to win a contest and this fat is not going away uh, through any other methods, then that's what you're going to have to do to win. And please give the serotogenesis inhibitor video a watch where I go over all over-the-counter supplements and other compounds which are known to inhibit the aromatized enzymes and thus lower serum estradiol levels. Moving over to the lower amps, which is mostly regulated by either insulin or glucocorticosteroids like cortisol and corticosterone, which the receptors you can actually block with certain anabolic androgenic steroids being oxandrolone, trembolone, and fluoxymesterone. Now, trembolone, you can consider at the end of a cutting phase or contest prep for the last six to eight weeks. Fluoxymesterone, maybe the last two weeks. I made an extensive deep dive about halotestin, I'll drop it, drop it very, very, very soon. So oxandrolone would be the most sustainable route to block the glucocorticoid receptors of the lower abs and potentiate favorable fat loss from that stubborn body fat areas. And don't you worry, we'll get to the insulin part when we address the lower back. Oxandrolone at a dose between five milligrams to 20 milligrams daily for the majority of your cutting phase is not something that I'm against because based on all the clinical literature and all of the blood work that I've seen, it seems that oxandrolone again is the most sustainable for the lowest side effects at this dose. And then at one point or another, if you want to make a switch to trembolone at let's say 70 milligrams to 225 milligrams weekly, then go right ahead. If you want to close it off your cutting phase, by that time you should already be shredded to the bone. Um, if you want to close it off with 20 to 30 milligrams halotestin, go right ahead. But I would only do that if you're going to step on stage and there's something to win. Right? There's a lot of opportunities for you to block the glucocorticoid receptors. And otherwise, there's over-the-counter supplements like ashwagandha root extract or emodin or phosphatidylserine, which are all known to reduce cortisol levels. I mean, even high quality sleep and vigorous exercise and micronutrient sufficiency are all known to suppress cortisol levels. So maybe you don't even need over-the-counter supplements or anabolic androgenic steroids to inhibit the effects of cortisol, right? Maybe through dietary practices, best practices, you can get those levels down. And again, otherwise, 
um, Emodin is known to reduce the synthesis of cortisol and corticosterone by inhibiting the 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1 enzymes, but fluoxymesterone inhibits the 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2 enzymes, which converts cortisol and corticosterone into biologically benign metabolites. I addressed this in the Halo testing video, which is dropping soon, but I haven't really talked to anybody who made a specific combination of Emodin and fluoxymesterone together, right? So proceed with caution. Maybe you just balance out your cortisol levels. And then the net result of that is that at least your blood pressure doesn't go up, but your fat loss on the lower abs doesn't go down either, right? So again, do some additional research if you're going with these routes. And besides these methods, and this might sound a little bit counterintuitive, there is something to say for using topical glucocorticoid steroid cream, which might have a catabolic effect on adipose tissue, but it's mostly known to help retract loose skin. If your skin is a little bit flabby from being overweight for the majority of your life and you suddenly got in great shape, or you had a killer off season where you ate a boatload of food, 7,000 calories per day, resulting in distension, stretching out the skin on your lower abs, then a small application of a glucocorticoid steroid cream might be able to help you get your skin thickness back again it doesn't work for everybody some people with terribly loose skin or flabby skin still need to undergo surgery like you would undergo surgery for gynecomastia and again it's pointless to use glucocorticoid steroid creams in combination with glucocorticoid receptor inhibitors like oxandrolone trimbolone or fluoxymesterone because you're blocking the receptors and not a cream and its active pharmaceutical ingredient can potentiate this skin thinning effect allowing it to retract and making everything look cosmetically appealing again after a couple weeks of usage so you have to go with either or here are a couple examples of skin thinning glucocorticoid steroid creams have a look do additional research and see if you want to use it don't overdo it because just like ketoconazole shampoo or minoxidil shampoo if you overdo it and these um, ingredients go systemic you might have severe adverse effects so you already got out of the lazy river on your holiday to the water park but somehow the swimming tube is still there and it keeps following you around that's some dad bod lower back gains baby adipose tissue of the lower back is the most dynamic stubborn fat area of the body it's easy to come on but it's also very easy to diet off so it's not exactly stubborn after all fat storage on this area is mostly regulated by insulin and what's the best way to control your insulin levels fasting Fasting is very good for the face and the lower back, but fasting isn't very sustainable. So what about intermittent fasting then? With an eating window of six to eight hours where you're fasting for, let's say, 16 to 18 hours out of the day and keep insulin secretion and overall insulin levels under control. Also very favorable for fat loss from the lower back. Now, if you want to have an influx of protein multiple times per day because you want to stay anabolic, then I would say a ketogenic diet is probably the most sustainable option out of all of the diet practices where insulin levels are continuously low for the majority of the day. And whether that's a traditional ketogenic diet or modified ketogenic diet where you have some fruit post-workout, this is what I'm doing. I don't have any impairment of fat loss off the lower back. Maybe you need to go full carnivore. Long story short, carbohydrate restriction and thus lowering insulin levels throughout the day seems to work best for spot reduction of fat off the lower back but with continuous dieting for longer periods of time you see that the lower back gets leaner and leaner and leaner the longer the diet continues and as long as you're not messing with your insulin sensitivity by taking mk677 for example or taking too much long-acting insulin then it's good for you then i don't see a reason why you wouldn't get lean off the lower back for a couple of weeks that you're dieting and again, to be perfectly clear, I'm not against using a long-acting insulin like Lantus during a cutting phase or contest prep, but there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And on the topic of combining MK677 with a long-acting insulin, don't you worry, I already have a video on it. I'll link it down below. So if you want to accelerate fat loss from this stubborn body fat area being your chunky lower back, look into Yohimbine or Rivalcine, which are stereoisomers of each other, but it appears that Rivalcine has less tangible side effects compared to Yohimbine. Whatever you can source, whatever your preference is, the dosages are generally between three milligrams up to six milligrams daily. And since these compounds block the alpha adrenergic receptors of adipose tissue, specifically of the lower back, it's probably best to take these before fasted cardio, when generally speaking, insulin levels are their lowest because it's the insulin that offsets the fat loss effects of the Yohimbine 
or the revolt scene. Just before warned, both Yohimbine and a revolt scene can make you feel pretty anxious and weird overall. And it's also known to potentiate a good amount of water retention in the lower back. So it might make you look worse in the beginning before it starts to get better. It might actually make you think that you're getting fatter due to all of this extra water retention in the lower back. Don't worry, with time, the lower back fat will shrink and then the water retention will slowly come down, but it will still be there and it will take about two weeks to fully dissipate. So before you step on stage or doing a photo shoot, cut the Yohimbine or a roll scene out at least two weeks before um, needing to look exceptionally good. And the lower back is also very responsive to glucagon and whether you take insulin before fasted cardio to stimulate glucagon release, that's probably a subject for a different video. Glucagon is also contained within retrotutides, which is a combination medication of GLP-1, GIP plus glucagon. It's available on some of the gray area peptide websites. And there's also glucagon hypo kits, which diabetics use when they accidentally overdose their insulin and they're very hypoglycemic. Glucagon injections causes the liver to dump all of its glycogen stores into the bloodstream, increasing serum glucose concentrations. And of course, we're not doing the full one milligram dose because we're not severely hypoglycemic. I would go with 0.25 milligrams, maybe even 0.1 milligram of the glucagon hypo kits if you can source them. They're quite expensive. But a combination of injectable glucagon, whether that comes from retrotrutide or from the hypo kits in combination with yohimbine or rolcine, whichever one you prefer, that really seems to melt the fat off the lower back. And when it comes to visceral fat, prevention is the best cure. Just don't eat like an asshole during the off season. Make better food choices. Don't saturate yourself with saturated fat because that will be stored as visceral fat or within the liver, giving you non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And don't, for the life of you, start slamming 200 grams of simple sugars with essential amino acids and fast-acting insulin into workouts or post-workouts because that's not the right way to do it. A large portion of that will be stored as visceral fat. And this is the sole reason why we saw so many bloated stomachs during the 90s and early 2000s. The removal of visceral fat takes time. It may take a lot of time. Here are a couple methods which are known to remove visceral fat, fasting being the most cost-effective one. So again, fasting is good for the face, the lower back, and also intestinal fat surrounding your organs. Fasting isn't very sustainable, and even a three to five day fast might not remove all of the visceral fat that's been building up during the off season. So you might need to do multiple fasts to get rid of everything. Now, Besides fasting, you can also take metformin. Plenty of scientific evidence that shows that metformin reduces visceral fat. There's um, a couple medications with unpronounceable names, so let's not go into it. There's GLP-1 and GLP receptor agonists, like liraglutide, diluglutide, exenatide, semaglutide, terzepidide, and retrotrutide. A good amount of scientific evidence behind it that some of these medications can reduce and remove visceral fat. Sodium glucose co-transporter type 2 inhibitors, like empagliflozin or canagliflozin, are known to reduce visceral fat. And orly stat, which basically prevents dietary fat absorption by acting as a lipase inhibitor, can also reduce visceral fat. The problem with all of the scientific evidence, and you might not identify as such, is that the large majority of these studies performed have been performed on very unhealthy people with type 2 diabetes or other metabolic syndromes. So if you give yourself visceral fat by, again, megadosing the simple sugars, essential amino acids, and um, fast-acting insulin which is well almost similar to type 2 diabetes, right? Um, then your mileage might vary. And the only real way of getting rid of all of that dirty visceral fat is by fasting multiple times. Let's move down to the lower body. It's very important for you to understand that the lower body is, uh, regarding water retention, is highly dependent on the lymphatic system, which transports uh, fluids from the extracellular space through the lymphatic system into the heart, where it gets pumped around, eventually ending up in the kidneys where you can excrete it in urine. And while the lymphatic system doesn't directly contribute to fat loss or fat redistribution from the lower body, it does contribute to fat absorption, particularly fat-soluble vitamins from the intestinal tract. So again, through movement, you can stimulate the lymphatic system, allowing for a normal balance between the intercellular and extracellular space in adipose tissue, particularly of the lower body, allowing for free-form fatty acids and glycerol to exit adipose tissue, end up in the bloodstream, where it can be metabolized into energy and thus fat loss 
occurs. And it seems that the Stairmaster activates the lymphatic system the most, which is unfortunate because the Stairmaster is brutal. It provides the most hip, knee, and ankle flexion and articulation out of all available cardio machines, with the elliptical being a close second, and the treadmill is still a good way to go to activate the lymphatic system. Just make sure you walk on an incline of at least 3%, right? Put in the work, activate the lymphatic system, and get lean on the lower body. Now, besides this, the activity, you can also sleep with your legs under pillows. This allows all of the fluid from your lower body to drain, whether that's through the lymphatic system or directly into the bloodstream, ultimately ending up in the kidneys, which makes you pee multiple times throughout the night. But then at least you wake up with shredded ankles and you can see all of those micro veins um, to the point you start to feel pretty good about yourself, right? This is a free way to get your lower body lean by redistributing all of the water retention that you might build up during the day. And then there's always selective estrogen receptor modulators, Novodex, like we discussed on how to get rid of stubborn chest fat at the exact same dosages and the exact same reasoning when you're already six to 8% body fat, right? When your lower body is lean, but not quite lean enough, you still have a little bit of stubborn fat on your glutes or on your hamstrings. So in the side chest pose, you can't really see the separation yet. Then and only then is when you deploy the Novodex at let's say 10 to 20 milligrams per day over two divided dosages. Okay, moving over to systemic fat loss. We covered all of the stubborn body fat areas, but sometimes you're simply not getting leaner. One of the reasons being is that fat metabolism within the adipose tissue is slowing down. You can take 5-amino-1-MQ for that, which is an N-methyltransferase inhibitor, which would otherwise metabolize nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide within adipose tissue. And if you inhibit this enzyme, then you potentiate NAD plus recycling, which helps to sustain fat metabolism within adipose tissue. And thus, the fat release from adipose tissue, whether that's actually free-form fatty acids or triglycerides or glycerol, is just continuous. So as you get leaner, let's say 8% or 6% body fat, and you feel that further fat loss is inhibited, look into 5-amino-1-MQ to sustain these processes. Unfortunately, 5-amino-1-MQ hasn't been extensively studied. I made several videos about this compound linked down below. It seems that the best dosages for both men and women are anywhere between 50 milligrams two times to three times daily. So that's a total dose of, let's say, 100 milligrams to 150 milligrams 5-amino-1-MQ per day. But since it's such an expensive compound, I would only consider it when you're already 8% body fat and further fat loss is stalling to a certain extent. Again, deploying all of the other fat loss pharmacology aids for stubborn body fats, which we just discussed. So if you're 8% body fat, fat loss stalls, then 50, 100, 150 milligrams 5-amino-1-MQ goes a very long way, especially in combination with either injectable IV NAD+, or uh, over-the-counter supplementation orally with nicotinamide mononucleotides or nicotinamide ribocytes, which again, all help with NAD plus concentrations within adipose tissue, which is now elevated to a greater extent because you're inhibiting these enzymes that would otherwise break it down. So in combination with clenbuterol or cardarine or injectable carnitine, 5-amino-1-MQ will go a very long way, right? Um, all of these don't really potentiate fat loss from stubborn body fat areas. But if you start deploying the 5-amino-1-MQ, the clenbuterol, the injectable carnitine, and perhaps other fat loss aids, which we didn't discuss previously, when you're stalling, then it's actually pretty easy to get below 8% body fat. Again, if desired, most people would be happy with 8%. You already look pretty damn good. And none of these drugs are actually required to get you down that low. And then a couple more compounds to close this video off with. There's Helios, which is a combination of injectable clenbuterol and yohimbine, which seems to spot reduce stubborn body fat areas and has been very extensively used and quite popular with bodybuilders to get certain body fat levels under control, right? It can be used in the lower back, can be used on the glutes, the hamstring tie-in, can be used on the lower abs. Um, it is, um, right, you're bypassing oral metabolism, so the bioavailability is extremely high. So you need to dose uh, injectable clenbuterol and injectable yohimbine very, very, very carefully. And then there's injectable MIC blend formulations. MIC stands for methionine, inositol, and choline. And these three helps with fat mobilization from adipose tissue, allowing you to have favorable fat loss regardless of where you inject it. 
Of course, you have a lot of a localized effect of the MIG administration, but it mostly goes systemic and then helps with fat transport from adipose tissue um, all over the body. A lot of people swear by this alongside injectable carnitine. And again, many of the gray area peptide websites actually have combinations of MIC, methionine, inositol, and choline, plus carnitine, and perhaps a couple goodies alongside of those. Very favorable for fat loss through subcutaneous administrations, um, but it isn't always required. I would only deploy these if you have stubborn body fat areas that are not responsive to the other methods which we just discussed. And I'm not entirely sure if cryolipolysis is an effective method to get the body fat levels under control, which are otherwise stubborn and again, don't react to the drugs we just discussed. It's basically a machine that applies extreme cold to a particular area of the body and thus freezes the fat cell to the point it might even break apart. And now through autophagy and uh, cleaning up those dead fat, fat cells, you get fat loss as a result of that. And apparently there's also a treatment or an upcoming treatment where they inject frozen glycerol crystals into adipose tissue, causing them to be destroyed and thus you metabolize the entire adipose tissue from the body, fat included. I heard Dante Trudel talk about it. If you can find the Instagram post, I'll link it down below. It looks very promising, but I'm not entirely sure if that's available anywhere so far. And there's also laser heat treatment. Uh, but I've never used that myself, so I'm not entirely sure if that would work. Um, these are all very popular treatment, or at least the cryolipolysis and the laser heat treatment. So it might be worth looking into if you have some disposable income um, that you're probably better off spending on growth hormone. And let's leave it here. I hope this gives you some ideas to get your fat loss journey going and end up shredded everywhere. You still are going to have to put in the work though, right? You can't outdrug a bad diet or lack of activity. And if you're willing to risk kidney failure with FTDP adipotite or risk death by using DNP, then again, this video is not for you. There are people out there who do that. Unfortunately, I can't help you with those. It sounds very deleterious to me. What is your favorite way to remove stubborn body fat areas? And if I forgot something, let us know down below in the comment section. Maybe we can do a follow-up video and get nasty diced and shredded everywhere, maybe even without the use of performance enhancing drugs, but I highly doubt it. Okay, thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. All of the videos which I just discussed will be there. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve, Vigor's crew. You guys know what to do. I mean, look how shredded I am and I took none of this. I just follow a ketogenic diet. Right? Dieting is still key. I do my daily fasted cardio. That's still key. And you don't have to overcomplicate it. You just have to diet for a long period of time. And then you end up shredded just the same. Look at all of those natural bodybuilders that are diced to the socks. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.